What's good, everybody? I'm Jay Webb, and this is Over Quota, where I interview founders, CEOs, sales leaders, and top enterprise software salespeople about the keys to consistently exceeding sales expectations. Now, my goal for this interview and others is to give listeners something in addition to the sales coaching that they might already be getting by listening to other sales leaders and other coaches, frankly, about in top salespeople that have already achieved the success that they want to achieve. Now, I should mention before I introduce my guest that my company, the J. David Group, is sponsoring this podcast. My company helps high growth software companies recruit top software salespeople, of course. If you want to learn more about that, go to the jdavidgroup.com. That's T H E, the letter J, David, like the name, group.com. Also, like my guest's first name here, you'll meet in a minute, uh, forward slash hiring. So, the jdavidgroup.com forward slash hiring, or go to the jdavidgroup.com forward slash looking if you're looking for another job. Now, today's guest is David Susan. He's a sales performance coach that helps enterprise sales reps shorten their sales cycles and sell more. David, welcome to Over Quota. Hey, Jay. Thanks so much for having me today. Absolutely. Thanks for, for joining me. I appreciate that. Um, so let's just start there with what I just ended with. Talk to me a little bit about your backstory and how you got into sales. And then we'll get into, you know, present day. So, you know, if anyone could be the accidental salesperson, that was actually me. I uh, got my degree in engineering and I was working, I had an internship with Hewlett Packard. I was doing programming and I'm like, I, I don't want to do this. And I went to a job fair. Hewlett Packard was there. I talked to him and I said, you know, what, you know, what opportunities do you have? I've got a degree. And they said, Hey, you know, if, if you didn't want to be an engineer, you don't want to be technical. You could be this thing called a sales engineer. And they explained it as, you know, basically what you would do is you're the liaison between the salesperson and the uh, client and you kind of talk technical. And that was when they were selling very technical products. Uh, it wasn't like enterprise software so much back then. And so it required that you had an understanding. And I thought, oh my gosh, this would be perfect. I would love to be able to 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 work with customers. I'm not a salesperson. I don't have a sales personality. I was introverted. I was quiet. I was shyish, and uh, so I I was trying to actually desperately to move out to the Bay Area. I wanted to be in Silicon Valley. I I sent out probably 50 resumes all over. Nothing appeared. And then one day I see on the bulletin board at the university, this little uh, sign that says IBM is interviewing. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, well, you know, IBM, HP, they're two of the top uh, tech companies in the world at the time. So I go into this interview and I get, I get asked back. I fly out to the city where I work, uh, where, where the job was. I interview, I end up getting the job and it was called a marketing rep. And what I came to find out is it, was pure sales. I get the job offer. I needed a job. It's IBM, it, which was actually one of my dream companies. It was, it was one of the companies I had wanted to work for because I, I, it was just great reputation. So I accept the job. And then after I accept the job, I'm like, oh, sh darn. And I'm like, what do I do? And I started reading books. I started listening to audio programs. IBM puts you through their own training, but I knew nothing about sales. And because it was so foreign to me, I really, I just started devouring anything I could find on sales. And, uh, and then I, that's how I, that's how I got, that's the backstory. That's really how I got started. And then you at IBM, it was selling enterprise solutions. It was software. It was multi-million dollar solutions, things like that. You mentioned that you were, you know, you didn't necessarily look at yourself as a salesperson. You were introverted, you were shy, you know, all that stuff. When you started to either work with salespeople as a sales engineer or, you know, when you got into that marketing rep role at, at, at IBM, what did you, obviously that was a misconception, I would imagine. So like, what, what were some of the things that you thought a sale, a good salesperson was that frankly, when you got into that role, turned out not necessarily to be the case? You know, that's a great question. So, so I think the challenge for many salespeople is their first experience or only experiences they have with salespeople are the people that are knocking on your, your door when you're, you're a kid living at home, or you go to the mall and they're trying to sell you something at this kiosk, or you go to buy a car. Uh, I call these one and done sales. Um, point of sale, they are a 
they, they don't have a second chance to, they're not building a long-term relationship. And if they don't close that deal right then, they have nothing. And many of these folks are 100% commission. So the problem is they're, they can be very aggressive. They can use these techniques, tactics. And the problem is if that's all you know and that's what you think sales is, you carry that forward into more business sales, which is all I've done. I've never been a sales engineer. I've only been in sales and sales management. And the, the problem is your perception of what sales is in the business environment is wrong. And so then you begin to burn bridges. You begin to treat people like it's a one and done sale. But some of the sales I've done are, are they're multi-year sales. They're six figure, seven figure sales and long sales cycle. So it requires a very more consultative approach. And then the understanding of how do I, how do I move the deal forward and how do I move, how do I work with multiple decision makers? So I think that was the biggest misconception I first came in of what I really thought sales was. And then when you get into that environment, and like I said, you're selling a six figure deal, you know, and I'm 23 years old, you, you have to let that go and shift and learn that, that that's not what real selling in, the, in our business environment, I should say, is, or enterprise sales environment is, or complex sales environment. And I'm gonna, I want to come back to you to ask you about um, your definition of a consultative sale and what that, what that looks like. But um, how much of your engineering background uh, shaped your early, I guess, success and transition into sales that, frankly, a lot of people don't necessarily have that, right? That right brain, left brain combo like you have working together. <laughs> you know, I, I th it's so funny. Most of my peers that I've met over the years don't have a technical background, even though they're most of the time I was in uh, very technical sales roles. So I was, it was software sales, it was enterprise, it was uh, storage systems, it was uh, large infrastructure, things like that, business software. Uh, most people don't have it. Um, I think and you can be very successful with or without it, right? Well, and we can talk about some of the, that strengths later that people have. I think for me, the pros and cons. Early in my career, I probably overanalyzed analysis paralysis. And so it probably hurt me in some ways, but in other ways it lended credibility for me. And I think the reason is I could speak to a technical buyer, right? All the folks in IT, I could, I had training and business understanding so I could talk to finance folks. I learned how to deal with procurement for complex decisions, especially got large government contracts. And I learned how very early with IBM, how to deal with VPs, CFOs, CTOs, CEOs, board members. And so I think my greatest advantage was having the understanding across the entire spectrum. And I think a lot of salespeople don't take the time to understand that spectrum of people and the personality types often don't warrant themselves to be comfortable dealing with a technical buyer who is more analytical. And because they can't relate and they can't understand, oftentimes they, they don't build the rapport and the connection with them. And I think that's probably the advantage for me, mm -hmm. but it's not a showstopper for people. I, I train and coach people all the time and it doesn't matter if they take the time to understand who those people are, what they really care about and understand their, their decision-making process and the value propositions. Talk to me about that. Um, you mentioned consultative sales a little bit earlier, and then you just, I heard you say decision-making process. What, what is your definition? How do you, how should we define consultative uh, sale? And then what the, how would you, is there a term that you could use to define the kind of sale where somebody walks up to you, like your door, like you said, as a child and makes a very quick sale? What's the, what's the difference for people that don't know? So to me, consultative, you know, it's, and I have to be real frank with you. I wrote, I wrote about this recently, consultative, people kind of throw that term around. They go, oh, I'm consultative. Well, that's what it means is being that trusted advisor so that you see me as a value to help you solve your business need business problem. Uh, the, 
the problem is just building that consultative relationship with one person in an account where it is a complex sale. Complex I define as multiple decision makers or enterprise sales tend to have multiple decision makers. Typically it's around seven to 10 people that are involved in these decisions uh, that are more complex. The mistake consultative people make is they, they build the relationship, let's say with UJ and I, we're so tight. The problem is other salespeople are building the same relationship with you. They're taking you to the ball games. They're spending money on you. They're building a relationship. And now, you know, you, you, the, the problem is I got six or seven or eight other people behind you that, you know, finance uh, other business units that are involved in the decision. Yeah, it's great that I build a relationship with you, but if I can't get you to be my champion and I don't understand how to work with and get to those decision makers because you may be a blocker. All that consulting in the world with you doesn't make a hill of being. I mean, it, it matters, but it's not the only thing. Um, and then what was the second, second part of that question there? Um, I think that was, uh, that was essentially it. Oh, the, the, other, the other part of it was like, if it's not consultative, what's the, oh. you know, I, you know, I call it one and done point of okay. contact. Yep. Okay. And that's, you know, that's, that's what most of us and most of your customers mm. have experienced. Mm. Uh, and the problem with that is if they've had a bad experience when they went to go buy a car, they went to uh, buy something that was a single call point of sale. The, the problem is if your customer has had been jaded by that experience, they think the word sales is a cuss word and they they don't see you as that consultant walking in. They think you're going to try to manipulate. They think you're going to try to screw them over. And that's an uphill battle a lot of professional salespeople have if you are dealing with people who have not already had the experience of working with salespeople. And frankly, even if they have, I've had clients 20 years in the business as buyers and when I say buyers, I don't mean, I don't mean uh, procurement, but decision makers for large deals that have had sales reps over the years that are, that are push hard because those sales, their salespeople push hard because they're under pressure to meet quota. And so they'll do and say stuff that will tick off the customer and that sticks with them. And then when you walk in the door, Jay, let's say you're an enterprise rep, even if you're more consultative, in the back of their mind, they're thinking, oh, you're probably going to lie to me. You're probably going to try to screw me over. You are probably, you don't have my best interest. And so you are already walking in the door from behind the eight ball. And, and, and that's a problem that salespeople have and need to learn how to, how to eventually get past. So you need to know the salespeople and managers out there listening, you need to know that is some of the mindset that our customers already have. And if you, if you recognize it up front, it allows you to think differently. And that's why I call, I call it 180 degree selling, right? Yeah, it, it's a convert, it, you take an alternative approach the way most salespeople do. So you show up, if you're my customer, Jay, I wanna show up to you differently from all the other salespeople that you have ever dealt with. So you go, that guy's different, that gal's different. They're, they're, they're not typical, they're atypical, they're 180 degree from what I normally would expect, that's refreshing. And let's talk about that then. The, you know, obviously you mentioned 180 degree different from what people have experienced. You know, after interviewing thousands of, of people, right, over the years, high performing salespeople, um, what, and def how do you define high performing salespeople? And then what has separated those folks from everybody else? Yeah, great question. So in my in my years of doing this, I literally have interviewed thousands of high performers, mostly enterprise. Um, most are making in that six figure, right? A low six figure, maybe hundred something up to a million. And the majority probably in that two to 200 to a million range is, is where they're at. So pretty high uh, performing. And um, what I found is that so, so here's the fascinating thing. Mm -hmm. I learned by reading a crap load of books and doing the work and learning and learning and learning and learning and learning. 
What was fascinating is some of the highest performers I met, I actually went had the opportunity to go on sales calls with them. Um, I went on sales calls with uh, the number one ranked salesperson in the world for the biggest software company, a uh, cloud computing company in the world. And um, some of the top performers, these guys are make, you know, ranked number one. And I've been on calls with them and I was blown away and not, in the sense of I was impressed, I was actually blown away. Like, how can these guys be number one? You got to be kidding me. They didn't impress me in the call. It's not like they were highly polished. Um, and I couldn't understand how these, all, all these people were number one. Um, another guy I'd worked with, with, with one of the top software companies, uh, promoted, promoted, promoted. I, I checked him out on LinkedIn. He's now a VP. And I was like, you got to be kidding. I mean, I, I couldn't believe this. So after looking at thousands of high performers, I, I started to analyze and strip out, what are they doing different? Why are they different? And what I did is I actually broke it down. I said, you know, there's three key traits that they have that others don't. Uh, number one is they ha they're fearless. Um, and when I say fearless, it's not that they have the greatest skill in the world. It's that they were fearless enough to ask the tough questions, ask to speak to other decision makers, call the other people involved in the account. They weren't afraid of what is the risk if I go around you because I know if I stay with you, Jay, and we're touchy, you know, we've got a great relationship, we're touchy feely, and you said you're going to invite, you're going to introduce me to your boss eventually, and that's week after week after week, and it's not going anywhere. Those high performers are you know, fish are cut bait pretty, they realize, hey, Jay, you're a blocker. You're not, you're, you're, you're not helping me. I've got to find a way to go around you. And what they do is they'll, they'll, they'll work with their executive team, maybe to go in at a higher level. They'll have their manager work with their manager. For example, hey, Jay, I understand that, uh, let's say you're the VP. They'll have, they are not afraid. They're fearless having their manager perhaps call you if you're the manager and say, Hey, I understand one of my salespeople is working with your folks. Mm -hmm. I wanted to introduce myself, right? So they, they, they find leverage to, to work. They are not afraid. They're not afraid to make the follow-up calls. They're not afraid to cold call the, uh, the executives. They, they are absolutely fearless. And what happens is when they're absolutely fearless, it, it, when, they, when they're fearless, they come across as more confident. Uh, one of the quotes that I always say all the time is, uh, confidence is not what you gain. It's what you lose. Confidence mm -hmm. is when you lose fear, when you eliminate fear, confidence appears. And these salespeople come across as th th more confident because they, they don't have that fear. They don't have the best skills. They're just willing to do it. They're willing to make the calls. They're willing to, to pursue. They're willing to follow up. So that's one of them. The second one that I find is um, those top reps, they um, are driven to be number one. Uh, I use these examples all the time when I'm doing a training, I'll ask people and I'll say in a group, write down where you think you're going to be ranked. Let's say it's, you know, early in the year. And I'll say, write down where you think you're going to be ranked at the end of the year. Well, the top performers write number one. Everyone else will say top 10%, top 50%. And you will only work to the level that you expect you will succeed. Gold medalists expect to be number one. They, they, they play to be number one. They plan to be number one. So they play what I call balls to the wall. And if you look at all the top performers, the greatest basketball players, the greatest football players, the greatest, they play to be number one. That is true in sales. It is not by mistake. It is not happenstance. They play to be number one and they expect to be number one and they set the goal to be number one, but an average player does not do that. So that's the second one. Then the third one is um, they are better organized at staying on top of their opportunities. You know, even, even they don't drop the ball. Studies show the average rep, only 50% will ever follow up a second time on a lead only 25, it cuts in half, only 25% a third, then 12% a fourth. Sales reps drop the ball. I can't tell you how many times I had sales reps where 
I will say, what's, what's the status of this opportunity? And they go, I don't know. I sent them a proposal a week ago. I haven't heard back. Are you f- kidding me? It, they, they don't follow up and the top performers do. The top performers don't drop the ball. They are on top of all of their deals and they recognize, hey, is this a real deal or not? If it's a real deal, they push it forward. If it's not a deal, they don't leave it sitting in the pipeline, milking this thing and telling their manager, um, oh, no, it's going to close. It's going to close. It's work. They're working on it. They're... No, the top performers qualify the deal in or out. And the reason they're willing to do it and able to do it is they're continually filling the pipeline with real deals. So they don't have to milk the deal. This is the number one problem. If, if you're a rep or a manager listening, the number one problem that I heard as a manager and early in my career, I did it is you got these 10 deals in the pipeline. A few of them have closed. You milk the last ones. It makes your forecast look good. You forecast it to your boss. You go, yeah, it's going to close, going to close, going to close, going to close, going to close. You get to the end of the quarter of the year and uh, magically they evaporate. They slip or they don't close. And the reality is the better reps already knew it. They're not milking the deal. They're not lying to themselves. They're not lying to the boss. And when I say lying, it's not overtly. It's just we lie to ourselves. The, the top reps flush their funnel of crap and fill their funnel with real deals. So that doesn't happen. If, if they lose a deal, they've already got another one. So the three things, I call them balls. And I wrote about this in my book. They have balls. They're fearless. They play balls to the wall, right? They're goal-driven oriented. And number three, they don't drop balls. And, and that's the foundation of the core traits that I found after interviewing thousands of top performers. Now, on top of that, have they done the homework? Have they studied sales? Yeah, but a lot of these folks that I've been with on calls and I've experienced, they're number one, even without the techniques and tactics because of the other things. Yeah, that's what I want to follow up on, which is number one and number two, the fearless aspect and the driven aspect. As a sales coach, um, can you coach those that mentality into, you know, C players or people that aren't top performers? And, and if not, and I, obviously number three, um, you can, but talk to me a little bit about that. What are your thought processes there? Cause I'm sure you've come up. So that. that whole idea of, can you make a B and a, can you make a C a B, right? Can, can, can you move them up? My belief is you can, if they'd have the desire, mm-hmm. I was probably a C player when I started, I knew nothing about sales. I came in, I didn't have the background. I didn't have the personality. I didn't have the skill set. And I believe I went from a C to an A. Uh, at IBM, I was top 1%. And almost everywhere I've ever worked, I've been in the top 10% ever since. And I believe you can, if there's the drive and the desire, Michael Jordan, right? From a basketball standpoint, right? A BC player becomes one of the best ever. So uh, 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 Tom Brady, right? Uh, I think it was drafted fourth round, something like that, right? One of the greatest players ever. So can like sixth you, round. Mm-hmm. Sixth round. No, thank you. That's awesome. <laughs> but so can we grow? If, if the heart is there and the desire is there, number one, and then number two, if there is the desire to learn it grow and you have the right coaching. And I believe that if, if you gave me someone who was an A player who wants to be better, a B who wants to be an A, a C who wants to get better. I believe if they have the heart and the desire, I could totally turn that around and they could be one of the top people in their organization and drive consistency. So do I think a sales manager, if they knew what to do, how to do, had the right strategies, tactics, and process could do it? 100%, absolutely. I've done it. I've done it to, to, to help reps over and over again. And it's teaching them and there are strategies and ways to teach and help someone become fearless. There are strategies of goal setting and helping people learn to build the desire to want to uh, be number one or desire to hit the goal. Um, and a lot of a lot of my, I was my first guinea pig. Um, it was learning how to do it myself and how to become fearless and how to learn to be more driven so you want to be number one and and that wasn't me naturally so can you do it absolutely and being more organized so you don't drop balls strategies tactics there absolutely can you give me an example of that in terms of 
what someone can do, a practice of a mantra, who knows about <clears throat> becoming more fearless or, or driven? Or well, knows? so I would say, so driven, the number one thing to be driven, you know, some people naturally uh, love to win, hate to lose. It's probably the number one characteristic of top performers. I remember, I remember, uh, I think it was, uh, um, I think it was Charles Barkley. I, I could be wrong. I think it was Charles Barkley. There was an interview, uh, top basketball player, right? And he says, um, show me someone who says it's okay to, okay to lose and I'll show you a loser. And the second thing he says is, he says, one of the things he said is, he says that one of the big differences is people who, who win hate losing. Mm. He says that's probably one of the bigger characteristics. You know, you mm. look at top, they hate to lose. Mm -hmm. And so can that be coached? And I'll give you an example. Um, for me, I remember uh, two, two standout scenarios. I was sitting, I was at a, uh, a young company. I had been there probably maybe a year, less than a year. And I did okay. I wasn't number one the first year. I didn't come out of the gate quick. It was new, new learning for me. There were other sales reps that had already been there before me. And I remember sitting in a meeting, our national sales meeting, and they recognized the two, three top people. And I just remember sitting there going, I was so pissed. I'm like, I, this, I, this pisses me off that I was not number one. I was not, it just bugged the crap out of me that I was not being recognized. Now I didn't deserve to be recognized, but I just remember the feeling. And so I said, that's not gonna happen. That's not gonna happen. Next year, they're gonna call out my name. Mm -hmm. So I, I set a goal and I, and I wrote it down. You gotta write it down. It's, it's a wish if you don't write it down, you gotta write it down, create a vision board, right? And I, I'll talk more about this in a sec, some other things I did. And then, uh, so the next year I was number one, uh, I got promoted to a manager and then my team was number one. My sales reps were number one. And in fact, uh, one of my reps that I hired who had not, um, he didn't even have technology experience, but he had been a top performer selling toilet paper for uh, like um, one of the big, one of the big manufacturers that sells to hotels and stuff, right? Mm -hmm. And so I hired this guy, um, I hired him twice. He was my top rep. He left and he went on to be every, every job he's been in tech industry, every job he's ever had, he's been number one. So he's because he was so driven, even though he didn't have that skill set, mm. he, he had the characteristics and traits that I look for. So that was one. The second example that I remembered was uh, actually at IBM. It was September and they had a fourth quarter, uh, they had a fourth quarter, third quarter, fourth quarter deal. Uh, where if you if you sold X amount, and I don't remember the exact number, but if you sold X amount of, of whatever they were pushing, there was a ten thousand dollar bonus in it for you. And I looked at it, and I'm like, and I and honestly, my first response was, well, that's not gonna, not me. I'm not gonna make it. And I didn't have that initial drive because I thought I was too far behind on on this one product set or software that they were pushing, and. Mm. I, uh, and I said, wait a minute. I said, you know what? I think I need a little bit of motivation because I'm not really motivated just for the money alone. And what I found also myself after interviewing thousands is sales reps say they're money, money motivated. It's not the true motivation. Hmm. Like you, you dig down, you realize it's not purely money. Hmm. And so what I did is I had been playing golf and I had this old, old set of uh, sticks, golf clubs I'd been using for years. And I wasn't that good. I, you know, I was shooting in maybe high 90s, hundreds, but I was playing with customers. I was playing with my management team. And, um, and I wanted to, to be able to uh, get better. And I went to this golf shop. They make custom golf clubs. Brand new set was like $2,000, $2,500. And I said, you know what? If I can win this bonus, I'm going to buy the golf clubs. Hmm. And so I, I took a flyer. I picked out the clubs I want. I went through the whole process. I knew exactly what I want. And I took a picture and I put it up on my, in my office wall. And every single day, I looked at that picture of golf clubs. And I created a carrot for myself that pulled me forward. So instead of setting a goal of, se of selling an X amount of dollars to win the prize, instead of setting the goal of winning the prize, I said, what is an emotional carrot that truly is drawing me forward 
and motivating me to, to do something. And so I, I started seeing these clubs. I started, and then I started, I, I said the, where I bought the clubs, I was going to take, um, I said, if I also win, I'm going to take golf lessons from this pro who was amazing. He had already given me a few tips and out of all the golf, um, coaching I had ever had and course training I ever had, his resonated with me. It's like he got it at a root cause, which mm -hmm. is kind of how I, I'm a root cause guy. I get to root cause, fix one thing and it solves all the problems in sales, fix one thing in sales leadership. It, it makes sales leadership easy. And so he did that with my golf swing and like one little tweak. And I'm like, oh my God, out of the thousands of dollars I've spent on golf instruction, this guy was like in minutes solved my problem. So I got so excited about it. That became my carrot. And every day I focused on the carrot. And then I started putting together affirmations of affirmations about my behaviors of how I wanted to show up every day at work affirmations about, I can do this. So it became more real. And I got so excited and motivated. It drove me to push, 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 push. And the, the long story short, sorry, is I, I ended up uh, winning the 10,000 bucks. I want to I wanna show the rest of the story with your listeners, because here's the biggest problem. What most people do is they go, awesome. And then they go, well, you know, I really don't need the golf clubs. You know, I got bills to pay. I, you know, maybe you got a new kid. Maybe you got a, you know, you've got young kids, right? Oh, maybe we got to, we'll pay for this. We'll pay. That is the biggest mistake you will ever make in your life. Because if you don't treat yourself to the goal you set, your goal meant nothing. And so the next time you set a goal and say, okay, now I want to buy a car if I win this, you know, in the back of your mind subconsciously that you're just going to talk yourself out of it. So you go, well, it's a goal, but it's really, it's not really, I'm not going to do it anyway. So, you know, it'd be nice to have the money. So what I learned is, and this is one of the things I coach as part of mindset is you set a goal that draws you forward, whatever it is, it's a trip to Hawaii. It's to take your significant other somewhere. It's to buy something. It's to do something, whatever it is that is a true, exciting motivator. And when you win, you go spend the money on what it was, period. So after a little bit of head trash talk to myself, right? It's the, you, you should buy it. No, you shouldn't, you should, you shouldn't. I said, no, you know what? I set a goal, I have to reward myself because that's why I did what I did. I literally, that they announced that I won this deal. Um, I left work early. It was like 3.30 in the afternoon. I went to the golf shop. I put down 2,500 bucks. I bought the clubs. <laughs> and it is honestly the greatest feeling ever. And it has changed my life. It has literally changed my life from a sales perspective, a leadership perspective, a motivation experience, uh, and a coaching experience. And it is now the one of the cores that I do for goal setting is teaching people how to do this, working with them on the goal, and making sure when they execute the goal, they reward themselves. And, and sometimes it's mini goals, right? It, it's, I want the car, but in order to get the car at the end of the year, you know, your big bonus or your big sales, maybe you have mini goals along the way that draw you forward, right? The spa, the spa getaway weekend with your significant other, spouse, wife, what it has been, whatever. And it's like, okay, so you do the baby steps to move yourself forward. You mentioned root causes. A great story, by the way. That's that's fantastic. Um, you mentioned root causes. What are some of the root causes that you've seen as you're coaching salespeople and trying to to upgrade them, so to speak, uh, that that holds people back? Like you mentioned, head trash. Talk to me a little bit more about that. <clears throat> well, I think I think so. A lot of reps. Now, keep in mind, you know, the five five ten percent, the 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 top, the best of the best. That's not who we're talking about right now. They're probably don't have as much head trash and the VPs and executives that are hiring those salespeople, they assume every single person salesperson is perfect. They don't have it, but I, I will just tell you, it goes back to balls and the first ball is being fearless. It, everyone has some sort of um, head trash that holds them back. It may be cold calling. I know salespeople who can do multi-million, even billion dollar deals that cannot cold call. Mm. They're phenomenal consultants. They understand sales process, but they cannot do a raw cold call as opposed to some people that you meet and they're dialing for dollars maniacs. 
uh, one top performer, this guy named Tim that I had interviewed, um, was fascinating. He, I, I, on the, I interviewed him on the, interviewed him on the phone and he worked for a financial services firm and he was the number one, he was like 20 mid, mid late twenties. He was number one in his region selling stocks to high wealth individuals. And he was like number one. And I said, in your twenties and you're number one compared to these guys that have been nurturing these executives and wealthy people for years. How is it that you're number one? And I said, I got to meet you. So we met at, met at coffee shop. He walks in, this guy is six, five domineering figure. And when I shook his hand, he couldn't even look me in the eye and his handshake, even though he's huge, his handshake was like shaking the hand of a fish. Wow. And I'm like, how could this guy be? And so what was fascinating, so, so there's two parts of the story. He, did, he lacked confidence in person. That is not the type of salesperson that is going to be doing these enterprise sales, working with executives in person. His head trash, whatever it was, and we didn't dig into it, but I could just tell he didn't feel the confidence to be able to, to, to look you in the eye. But on the flip side, I said, how could this guy possibly be number one? And it was on the phone, right? Selling stocks, things like that, primarily investments. Mm -hmm. And I said, Tim, how is it possible? I didn't say it like that, but in my head, right? How, Tim, how, how, could, how are you number one? Young age, relatively young age, you're dealing with, you're competing against these folks who have been working with the same clients, executives for years. How are you number one? He goes, oh, that's easy. So I just make 300 phone calls a day and I work six days a week. Interesting. And I realized he just outworks everyone. I said, but don't you ever call someone, you know, you're calling Jay and you say, Hey Jay, or, you know, look, you know, I've got this opportunity investment, blah, blah, blah. And Jay, J Jay's a CEO or an executive or, and just goes, what the, you know, are you calling me for? Don't, how'd you get my number? Don't ever freaking call me again. The freaking hangs up on you. I go, doesn't that just eat you up inside? He goes, no, I just pick up the phone, dial the next one. <laughs> right. And what I learned is most salespeople can't handle that. They're right. Just, they're head trash. They don't have the ability to quickly drop that, the criticism, the, 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 a customer yelling at them, uh, a customer getting pissed because maybe a miscommunication, a cold call. And when I say cold call, I'm not talking dialing, dialing for dollars, Jay, in this, in this, complex enterprise sale. What I'm talking about is I, I'm dealing with you. I got to call your boss. I got to call someone else. I got to call finance. I got to call someone else. That's still a cold call. If you are not willing to make the introduction for me, we're going to try to make it warm, but it's not. But there, I can't tell you how many enterprise salespeople that are making six, even seven figures that can't do that. So people always have levels of fear so to answer your question, what, you know, head trash and, and things that hold us back, that's probably, it, it, number one is there, it plays out in different areas. Mm -hmm. And as I coach and work with people, that's what I, I drill down. I need to find out what is it, because those are the inhibitors. And when you can finally break through and go, this is the piece that's inhibiting me. I, I, I'm, I'm really good here, but I struggle here. That's when the floodgates open. What should sales leaders do um, when they're coaching their teams to, you know, flesh out some of that uh, head trash and and move them towards the three balls that you're that you're talking about? I think that's really important. Um, you know, so much, there's so much around. You know, we, we can talk about techni techniques and methodology and all the other stuff, but until you get at the core of, you know, what can move somebody forward, I feel like all that other stuff becomes irrelevant. So talk to me about that a little bit. I would say the, the, the biggest challenge related to what you just asked me, you know, you talked about what could they do to coach? Number one, actually do coaching. <laughs> right. I mean, number one, do it. Most sales managers in my experience, sales VPs in my experience, they, let's say they're hiring you, Jay, and they, they go, I shouldn't have to train you. So I hired you. Hmm. Yeah, you're right. When Peyton Manning is struggling, I shouldn't have to help him. When, when top athletes or individuals are struggling, you're right. I should just let them need to struggle and probably just get rid of them. That's not what we do. 
with professional athletes, we recognize I hired you for a reason. You have a strength. I know you can succeed. There's just something that's not there. Take the time, invest in your people. Inve the time and effort, money, train them. Don't just assume that I shouldn't have to. Well, the reality is you're right. In a perfect world, you shouldn't have to, but everyone is human. Everyone has stuff. You know, if, if someone is going through a divorce, that's going to impact their selling. If someone has um, just lost a child, I met someone this last week. I was, I was out in California uh, doing some work and someone had recently lost their child in the last 12 months. You, you can't tell me that that's not going to affect you, but if, if, sales managers and leaders don't give a crap about their employees and they don't care enough to understand what what is going on in their life and then being willing to coach and willing to help and willing we're we're, we're missing out on huge opportunity it is too expensive and jay you know this more than anyone it is so freaking expensive to replace salespeople. it is time it is money it's lost revenue it is easier and cheaper less expensive to coach. So number one, do the coaching, but then really take the time to be with people and build that rapport and that relationship so that if you're struggling, let's say it's you, Jay, you feel comfortable as a salespeople and I make you comfortable enough to come to me and go, I have to call reluctance. I am struggling. I have a problem here. I have a problem here. But that doesn't happen. You know how many, it is phenomenal, Jay, how many people I coach that will say, I can't say this to my manager. Hmm. I'm coming to you, Dave, to help me be better at sales because I need someone. I can't admit that I am dropping balls. I can't admit that I'm not organized. I can't admit that I'm not doing the follow-up. I can't admit that I have some call reluctance. I can't admit that I have a tell when I call a CEO in my voice, there is a tell that lets them know I'm a wimp. And by the way, that is the number one reason people fail. They get on, they have a tell. And most managers don't take the time to understand this. They don't, maybe they don't care. They don't feel they have time to do it. But I always look at it and I go, so what is your job then? You know, you're a coach on a football team. What is your job? Your job is success through your people. And if you, it's to see what they're not seeing and then get them the help, physical training, mental training, right? Skill training, helping them work together, right? As a team and putting that in place. And in, in the business world, for whatever reason, what I have seen working with thousands of organizations is we, they don't, we're not doing it. I interview VPs, I interview executives. I, I know they're not doing it. And I was there. They didn't do it to me either. So do the coaching, number one. Take the time to build that relationship so that your salespeople feel comfortable coming to you saying, I suck. I got a problem. I got crap happening in my life. I've got call reluctance. Even though I've been in sales 20 years, I talked to a guy. He closed a multi-billion dollar deal. Okay, so government government, government, right, contract, uh, um, huge billion dollar deal. And we were chatting. So I met this guy a couple of weeks ago at a conference in Dallas that, that I was hosting. And he says to me, and he'd been in sales 20 years, and he confided in me, goes, well, I couldn't do, I couldn't do that kind of sales. Like, wow, the calls, you know, like where it required like cold calling or something. Now imagine if he was still in a sales role, he's moved out of a sales role now in, in um, Imagine he's still in a sales role. Do you really think if I was a 20 year veteran, a 10 year veteran, even five year veteran working for you and you're my manager, you really think after five years, I'm going to go confide in you and say, Oh, by the way, I don't know what the hell I'm doing. It's not going to happen. So right. as a manager, that's, that's probably one of the things I did as a sales leader is you have to take the time to coach and understand and look at Jay and really understand and go, what are Jay's problems? What, where are his challenges? But if I don't give a crap enough and I don't feel I have time to do that, then I'm not going to do it. You're going to fail. But here's the problem, Jay. As a manager, if you fail, who else fails? Yeah. I fail. 
Right. And so it's worth the investment is what I found to, to train you and build your skills if you want it. Now, if you're the type of employee that doesn't give a crap, then I'm going to move you out pretty quickly. So, right. It's interesting when, you know, I often work with early stage startups that, you know, literally have maybe no salesperson and they're asking me to hire, help them hire their first salesperson, or, you know, maybe there's just a handful of salespeople and they tell me that they can't afford to have someone on their team that doesn't already hit the ground running, meaning that they don't have time to coach them. They don't have time right. for, you know, any of that stuff. It's they want to walk that all the time. Yep. They want you, to, they want them to walk in and they want them to just perform immediately. Right. So obviously there's more pressure on, on me to really make that happen. Right. To find right. that, that unicorn, um, right. so to speak, purple unicorn. Uh, purple even, unicorn. Yeah. And, and, and a, is what I used to call it. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Exactly. Yep, that's right. Um, in a lot of, in a lot of cases. So uh, you're right. And I think part of it too, as you're talking about this, I feel like a lot of coaches or sales leaders may not, may not only, not only be reluctant, but they might not even have the skill set to coach, right? They're not equipped. Um, and all the stuff that you and I are talking about here right now, and, and the three balls of course being paramount, but um, they just not, they just don't have the ability to do that because they've never been coached like that, right. I'm sure. And they just, they don't have that. They just don't have that skill set. So somebody like, and they don't think they need to, like you said. Right. Right. And also to your point as well about being fearless and about, you know, a sales rep, not necessarily being able to go to their, their manager or whatever and saying, I'm deficient in this. The sales leaders aren't necessarily going to admit that to themselves or they're not going to admit that right. to whoever they're reporting to. They well, like, report, right. They're exactly. Yeah. I don't yeah, want I'm, to, I'm, to I'm you. Sales, I'm the sales VP, but I'm going to go to the CEO and say, hey, I got to hire a third party trainer coach to help these guys because I don't have a freaking clue what I'm doing. Exactly. Right. And they might not even win it to. They won't you know, make them look bad. It'll make them look bad. That's right. That's right. Well, let's get you out of here on this one last question. And, and this has just um, been a wealth of information. So can, I, can I, real quick? Yeah. Can I address that real quick? What you sure, just said? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. This might be valuable to you and, and, the, and the folks that that are even evaluating you, Jay, as sure. should I bring you on. Mm -hmm. Quick comment on that. I'm going to give you an analogy. Maybe you can even use this with yours. I'm a brand new startup football team, and I'm going to go, I want to go hire Tom Brady. Mm -hmm. Number one, you can't afford him. <laughs> so, but I want the perfect quarterback who has won multiple Super Bowls, who's been an MVP. That's who I want. And I don't want to have to, and I don't want to ever have to train them. First of all, you are unproven entity if you're a young company and a young startup. And that top 10% person you want that's been making a half million dollars, forget it. I, I'm just going to be blunt. You're not getting them because you don't have something to offer. Yeah, but I'll give you a stock. <laughs> okay. I'm already making money. I've got the known over here. I've got the unknown over here you're not getting those people. So you know what you do? You hire that young Tom Brady. You hire the young Tom Brady and you invest in them. Why? Because they will do anything you want them to do. Yes, they've, you, got it. you get someone who's already got some sales experience and proven track record. One of, my, one of the guys I told you about that I hired, he had a proven track record selling toilet paper, right? Enterprise level toilet paper, right? But, um, <laughs> Didn't but know he had already thing, proved. Okay. Right, but he had the drive, he had the motivation. I, I put a little bit of time in to train him and he is a rock star. Everywhere he works, he is number one, right? He is always hitting his quota, it doesn't matter what it is. And we're talking in, that, in, the, in the very competitive software industry. So what I'm gonna tell your listeners who are looking at evaluating you and who's this J guy, I'm gonna tell you, if you're a young company and you're trying to find that purple squirrel, the purple unicorn, you can't afford them. So find someone who you can work with. And then the second thing is, if you don't have the time, effort, skill to train them, hire someone like me. Bring me on as their coach. Don't be ashamed. Don't be embarrassed. Use the football analogy. When, when Bill Belichick needs to coach Tom Brady, he gets a quarterback coach to coach Tom Brady. He gets a strength coach. He's not doing it. He's the, he plays quarterback. That's what I want your, your executives that you're working with, if they're to think about is 
hire the people that know what they are doing that are better at it than you. Focus on your strength. Don't go in and spend your time training and coaching if that's not your strength. Spend your time doing strategy, alignment, finding better people, uh, uh, understanding who are the territories, how do we compete? That's where you need to focus. But on that people side, the training, the coaching, hire someone like Jay to go find the right rock stars, hire people like me to coach, mentor, and train them, and you do what you do best. And in the end, you will make more money. You'll be the winning team. That's what I'm going to say about that. Absolutely. I couldn't have said it better. And thank you. This might be part of the trailer that I'm putting together. <laughs> ah, you said. Last question. You said. That's right. That's right. Well, the last question basically is, is that how can folks get in touch with you if they do want you to train them or coach them in their, their sales teams or simply just to say thank you for doing this? Hey, appreciate that. So uh, two ways to do it. If you want to uh, download my playbook that talk, gives you some insight into how I train and what I train, uh, my website to do that is www. 180, the number one, the number eight, the number zero, so 180, degreeselling.com, D-E-G-R-E-E-S-E-L-L-I-N-G.com. So 180degreeselling.com, you can download my playbook. If you want to reach out to me directly, uh, happy to give you my email. It's just david at davidsusan.com. And my last name is S-U-S-O-N. That's like S as in sugar, U, S as in sugar, O, N as in Nancy. So David at davidsusan.com. Um, for those of you, you know, I talked about my, my book a little bit. It's actually called Balls, The Three Secrets of Sales Success. And there's how you spell my name. Um, if you want to uh, get that, you, you reach out to me and I'll send you an autograph copy uh, and do that. Or you can buy it online uh, if you want to do that. But I'm happy if you buy it through me, reach out to me. Uh, and I'll autograph it, personalize it for you and or your team. So if you want to do multiple copies and just talks a little bit, it, it, it's uh, some of what I shared today with you, Jay, and they can reach out. So those are probably the two best ways to get me. Fantastic. David, I really appreciate this. This is just fantastic. Um, hey. I'm excited to share it with everybody and to get, if you're listening to, please share your feedback, leave a review, rate this. It really helps. And certainly reach out to David if you want more information or just to say thank you for him. Everybody, thank you for listening. You've just gone over quota. Bye, everybody.